The Capital Connection is a production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio. David Gustina is the producer of The Capital Connection. Support comes from United University Professions, representing 37,000 academic and professional employees at SUNY campuses and teaching hospitals across New York State. Frederick E. Cole, President, UUPinfo.org. And New York State United Teachers, representing professionals in education and healthcare, online at nysut.org. It's the Capital Connection. Hi, I'm Alan Chartok. Joining us today is State Senator James Skoufis, a Democrat from New York's 39th Senate District, which includes Newburgh. Senator Skoufis is chair of the Senate Committee on Investigations and Government Operations. Welcome back, Senator. You're the man of the hour. Thanks for being with us. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me back. Sure. Let's start with New York and Ukraine, because everybody's talking about Ukraine. Why should we be different? New York Governor Kathy Hochul signed an executive order forbidding the state from doing business with Russia, including canceling its investments there. The governor's executive order was signed Sunday. It says the state will, quote, not permit its own investment activity, whether directly or indirectly, to aid Russia as it commits these human rights violations and atrocities. Hochul also said New York will welcome Ukrainian refugees in response to Russia's invasion. She noted at the press conference in Albany that New York is the home to the largest Ukrainian population in the U.S. And so what are you hearing in your district? Look, I think what I'm hearing in my district is what everyone is hearing in every district, which is widespread, nearly unanimous uh, support and sympathy for Ukraine uh, in this in this war. Let's call it what it is. It's a war. And uh, and look, I, I spent some time in Ukraine last year, and uh, for the past 30 years, uh, they have been building a vibrant uh, democracy. And they look to the West, they look to Europe, they look to the United States uh, uh, as allies. And we need to be there for them in every single way possible as this monster, Vladimir Putin, uh, illegally invades them and commits these heinous uh, criminal acts of war. And so, you know, I applaud the governor for, for signing that executive order. I'll be frank, I, I'm, I, I do not know the scale of our investments uh, with Russia or in Russia. I'd be very interested to learn uh, what types of investments uh, we, we do have with them. But, you know, any investments should be cut I uh, uh, immediately, and I'm glad that the, the governor took that step. Well, obviously, Putin is a president, a politician, thought he could get away with this. Are you surprised by the reaction to what he has been experiencing, especially here in New York? I, I do think all the reporting indicates that he he did not expect this this firewall uh, uh, from really the rest of the entire world. And it's it's been heartening to see. I, you know, typically uh, look, you know, you don't have to look uh, very far into, into the past or in a very different location to understand why Putin uh, might have thought this would go differently in 2014 when he uh, annexed Crimea. Also in Ukraine, the, the world's response was, I would characterize as tepid at best. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that he's probably been emboldened over the years. Uh, Georgia isn't too far into the past where he effectively uh, uh, orchestrated a regime change and invasion in Georgia, a uh, neighboring country to Russia. And so uh, so I'm sure he was emboldened. And I am uh, I'm, I'm relieved and I'm heartened, as I think, you know, all uh, fair minded Americans and global citizens are to see the the very coordinated, uh, nearly unanimous response, uh, the, the Russian leadership. Uh, and the Russian economy deserves to be punished severely, harshly, like never before. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. Do you think it was a trap? I mean, he walked right into it. It did seem like he thought he'd get away with it like he had in other places. So do you think maybe this was a setup for him? I don't think so. Look, I, I think that everyone was, was hoping the entire time that he, he would not cross over into Ukraine. And this was some uh, silly show of military strength along the border. But he did it. And let's give credit where credit's due. Our intelligence, our American intelligence was spot on 
over the past mm-hmm. many weeks. Typically, right. we only you know talk about what the CIA, the FBI, or our counterintelligence uh, are doing when they get something wrong, like weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Let's be clear and let's give them credit. They were spot on every step of the way. And so I, I don't think this was a trap. I think there was hope until the very end that he would you know, reconsider, that he would not do this. Uh, but the, the response has been swift and heavy. I'm glad we're sending weapons and, and hardware into Ukraine, along with other uh, EU nations. You know, the Ukrainians have been uh, defiant in the best sense of the word. And, uh, you know, from from uh, from their leadership on down to the average citizen who's picking up arms and defending their country with no military experience, uh, they have the Ukrainian pride is uh, on the world stage right now for everyone to see. And the least we can do is make sure that we have their back. And I'm glad basically the entire rest of the world, save for a couple of countries, China uh, and India, for example, uh, we have had their back. You know, I am not a psychiatrist, but is there any way out? Now, what's really worrying me is if this is a guy, Putin, who thinks there is no way out, and he's started to talk about nuclear weapons, and that gets us into your territory, Senator. You represent a district in New York. And if this guy is so, well, crazy that he thinks that he has to, in order to maintain face, send a nuclear weapon our way. Unlikely it's going to happen, but if it does happen, have you thought about that? Look, I I think that everyone uh, has thought about it since he has started to mobilize those nuclear deterrent forces uh, uh, yesterday. Mm. And uh, there is is not a long line connecting the two dots, one being him as a madman and not as you described it, knowing how to get out of this, and the other dot being mobilizing nuclear arms. Uh, you know, it's it's not far fetched, and so it's it's horrifying. Of course, it's scary. I uh, you know the 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 one sense of relief that I have is that I do know that literally the entire world, the the uh, the, the global community, uh, is going to do everything they possibly can that we possibly can to make sure we we don't connect uh, those dots. Uh, or he doesn't connect those dots, rather. And so, of course, it's, it's, it's on my mind. I think it's on everyone's mind since the news yesterday. This guy uh, is off the rails. This guy is a madman, uh, I think we've seen, capable of just about anything. Do we in New York have a plan? Just in case he, that's a great that, question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, look, obviously, you know, our nation's defense is vested in uh, in the federal government, the Department of of Defense, our military. I I do not yet know because obviously this news broke just yesterday. I think afternoon. I do not know if the state has a role to play uh, if a situation like what we're talking about unfolds. Uh, that's a great question that I'm sure. Uh, the governor since yesterday has been engaged on, uh, and that's something that we in the legislature uh, ought to find out very soon. I suspect the primary, if not the exclusive role, is at the federal level, uh, but it's a good question. What do the states, uh, what, what is the state's role, if any, uh, if, if something like this does happen? We are talking with State Senator James Skoufis, a Democrat from New York's 39th Senate District, which includes Newburgh. Senator Skoufis, we are now hearing that the school mask mandate is being lifted, and New York Governor Kathy Hochul cited a dramatic drop in COVID-19 infections and new federal guidelines. Hours later, however, New York City Mayor Eric Adams said he's considering lifting vaccine mandates on restaurants, bars, and theaters by early next week. That's if infections and hospitalizations continue their downward trend. The mayor's statement also said that the mask mandate on the city's approximately one million schoolchildren would be also lifted. Are you concerned that this has become a political sort of battle or that we're being premature? So to answer your first question, I think that the politics of masks uh, is not something new. That horse is way out of the barn. Uh, and this has unfortunately and really sadly become a political issue for the past many months. Yes. Uh, not just the past days and weeks. And so and I will say that uh, the governor's decision, uh, I welcome it. 
in fact, just a little before uh, she came out with with the announcement, I, I did call on her. And I know some other colleagues have begun to do this call on her to really uh, begin to ease the uh, the masking restrictions in classrooms. As you know, and your listeners know, we did that for other indoor settings uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, look, most of us have done the hard work of vaccinating and masking and protecting our neighbors uh, and our COVID community levels uh, in the Hudson Valley and most of the state are quite low uh, right now. And so, uh, you know, winter break was last week for most school districts. Uh, Kids are now back in the classroom Uh, this week. I had hoped, I had wished that the mandate could be lifted starting today as opposed to a couple of days from now. I, because, you know, now kids are back in the classroom and got to put the mask on for two days and they'll have to take them off. It would have been, I, I think, a bit more seamless if coming back from the, uh, the winter break that this, uh, this, this was lifted. But it is a couple of days. I do think the timing is right. The levels are very, very low. And we've done, as I said, the hard work to get to this point. Uh, so it's welcome news. It's unfortunate this became so political because vaccines work, masks work, all the science points to that. Uh, and it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, some folks uh, rallied around anti-public health measures. Well, I couldn't agree with you more, but politics being what it is, it's happened How do we know that when the political establishment, you know, the legislature, the governor and others make their declaration that we don't have to do this anymore, that it's not more politics than it is reality, if if you're following me? I think it's incumbent upon us to explain exactly why we make a change in policy. And so the governor rightly pointed out that our COVID infection rates are 99 percent lower uh, than the the height of this past surge. And so, you know, that is why we are lifting these restrictions. Uh, now, I will say there was a disconnect that many people, I think, you know, rightly pointed to, well, why did the indoor mask mandate for other settings get lifted a couple of weeks ago and it took, you know, a bit longer for it to be lifted in classrooms? There really was not a cogent explanation out of the Department of Health. Uh, that that adequately explained that, and I think unfortunately fed into uh, some of that uh, politicization of of masking here in New York State. Uh, but this needs to be data driven, needs to be science driven, and the the announcement accompanied uh, that data and that science, and that is that our levels are very very low now, and it's time to. Uh, to, to make this optional again in school districts. Okay, let's go to a different subject. What's a recap and how does it help us fight gun violence? I know that you've been going around getting some money for it. So tell us. So, so recap is a not for profit based out of Orange County uh, here uh, here in the Hudson Valley. And it's as a regional economic community action program. And they've they've done a lot of work in a lot of spaces, including housing uh, and social support. Uh, But uh, more recently, uh, they've taken on the responsibility of being the agency that uh, that has implemented the SNUG program in the city of Newburgh. And SNUG, for your listeners who don't know, is guns spelled backwards. Uh, It is it has been a very successful uh, uh, gun violence Uh, intervention program throughout the state. There are some programs in the city. There are some programs uh, in Westchester and Long Island. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, through the state budget process, through some new funding, I brought the program to the city of Newburgh. And RECAP is the organization, the not-for-profit, that administers and and oversees uh, the SNUG program. And so, so look, you know, violent crime is up in in many parts of not just the state, but in the country, uh, and that includes shootings. And uh, having a program like this in place is uh, is a, a part of the solution. And uh, it's, a, it's a program that I'm looking to continue funding in this year's state budget to make sure they can continue doing the good work they're doing on the ground. We are talking with Senator James Skoufis, a Democrat from New York's 39th District, which includes Newburgh. Senator Skoufis is chair of the Senate Committee on Investigations and Government Operations. So, Senator, let me ask you this. Do you think that with the tension that exists in the world 
over our major problems that attention to what goes on in New York State is less than it should be? The answer is yes, but I don't think that it that that is a uh, it's a product of the tension around the world. I think, unfortunately, the the good work that we by and large do here in New York State uh, has flown under the radar, even under more normal times. And it, look, it's you know you turn on cable news; they don't cover New York State government and politics. They're covering what's happening in Washington. They're covering what's happening around the world. Uh, you know, as community newspapers sadly continue to fade away and go out of business or close shop, you know, you're left with these publications that do good work, but they're just, you know, more regional or they're national in nature. And so, yes, I do think, unfortunately, that, uh, you know, the, the, the legislation, the laws, everything that we're doing in New York is not front of mind for most people because, you know, outside of, you know, your program and, and uh, a handful of others, um, there aren't too many that are really shining a light on uh, on what's happening uh, in, in their state government. And, uh, you know, most of the focus is on national and international news. That raises an interesting question. It's been brought up before. Do you think the government should give struggling newspapers, and they are struggling, money to survive? Yes, I do. Uh, I think that it is. it would be a public service for New York State. To, uh, to to bolster our community newspapers, our local radio, our, our very local TV, uh, as much as we possibly can. And uh, we have not done hardly any of it. Uh, and look, there, there are even some ways uh, to, uh, to, to, you know, sort of connect both that support I just described with also doing a uh, a broader public service, I'll call it, and, and making sure that, uh, for example, notices, right? So we have laws that dictate notices uh, and what kinds of projects, what kind of local government decisions have to be advertised in a local newspaper. And I think that, you know, we can both support those local newspapers and also support the dissemination of information uh, if we, for example, require better notification of uh, various government decisions and bids and projects. Uh, But to answer your question fundamentally, yes, we need to be doing a lot more because as these local outlets continue to fade and they are struggling, I, you know, the, the, the folks that get hurt the most, besides the folks who, who run those, those outlets, are our consumers of that news. And, uh, and they can't hold their elected officials as, count- as accountable. They can't digest what's going on, uh, of course, as much. And so it's incumbent upon us as a state, I believe, uh, to better support our local outlets uh, so that people aren't just left with the national and international news outlets that are out there that are also doing good work. Well, you know what? Not to prolong the agony here, I truly have questions as to whether the state should be paying newspaper publishers money for their own businesses. I mean, if they're national public radio stations, you know, not-for-profits, I get it. But I I know some publishers who I have some questions about. So there would have to there would no doubt have to be guardrails. You can't just have you can't just, you know, open up a website, call yourself a a news source and, you know, be eligible for money uh, as a fly by night kind of, quote unquote, news outlet. Uh, These have to be legitimate publications. They have to be legitimate outlets. Uh, You know, they they have to be objective. So there has to be there have to be standards, of course. Um, But but I, I do think that we can't just sit idly by. Uh, and let all of our our local news outlets uh, continue to struggle and close shop. I don't don't think that's a a viable option. Senator James Skoufis, I got a question for you. I know the Democrats got sort of whiplashed on bail reform. Speaking of the uptick on gun violence, many Republicans blame bail reform for the problem. So what potential solutions do you see coming, if any, from Governor Hochul or Mayor Adams? Uh, Mayor Adams has, has been clear in that he wants a dangerousness standard. Uh, attached to the bail reforms or amended into the bail reforms. Uh, look, I, I came out publicly for a public safety standard back in January of 2020 when the implementation, basically the day the implementation of the bail reform started. Uh, and so I've been on the record for the past 26 months or so that there needs to be better discretion for judges. Uh, what we can't continue to allow is 
for uh, for perpetrators to you know shoplift on Monday, be given a ticket, and shoplift again from the same store on Tuesday, be given a ticket, and repeat and repeat and repeat. That's you know society should not accept that. And so, so I do think even if we don't go with a public safety standard, there are tweaks that we can make to bail reform that preserve the intent here of making sure that there is not uh, uh, financial economic discrimination in our courtrooms, where if you're wealthy and you could afford bail, you're treated one way. And if you're not, you get to uh, wait in a jail cell until your trial. We can, we can preserve that intent while also making sure that we address these uh, these situations that are unacceptable to society. So I do hope that in the next four weeks or so, as budget negotiations continue, uh, that we can find a reasonable way forward to strike that balance. Now, I will point out that violent crime is up in most places around the country. And most places around the country did not do anything to their state's bail reform. Uh, and so, you know, it's it's not a uh, it's not a, a totally fair argument to connect those two dots and say this is the only reason why this is happening, because if that was the case, you wouldn't be seeing violent crime increase in any other state that didn't touch their bail laws. Senator Skoufis, a recent report from the New York State Senate Investigations and Government Operations Committee, which you chair, finds the executive branch has been lax in producing state-mandated studies on a variety of subjects. The report finds that 41% of studies required by state law between 2016 and 18 were never completed. Do we write too many reports? Do we put them on the shelf? Are we remiss in the way in which we do this kind of thing? So, so I think it's a fair but separate question. Do okay. we do too many of these studies and reports I, I, as legislation. And look, you know, I've I've been a critic of the number of study bills that come to the legislature. Uh, I think we're very capable of studying a lot of these issues and we should just legislate the solutions instead of farming mm-hmm. out mm-hmm. Uh, the, the studying. But what this report showed is that when we do pass these bills and make no mistake, these are not requests of agencies. These are not we would like you to do these things. This is the law. We are directing state agencies to engage in studying an issue and to issue a report. And so the fact that nearly half of these reports, these mandates, were summarily ignored is alarming. I think it, it and I will say it, I do believe was a byproduct of perhaps the last administration's culture as it relates to uh, respect for the legislature and respect for our directives uh, and, and, and our will. Uh, and I'm optimistic that the current administration will treat uh, these directives and the broader legislative governor relationship uh, with more respect. Uh, but that report that you're referencing from the investigations committee, uh, it ends with a note that if this continues to happen, and especially with those flagrant uh, agencies, and the Department of Health has been really, really bad in particular, we should sue. The legislature passes a bill mandating something happens, and if the agencies continue to ignore our will, then we should sue. Uh, And then perhaps they'll get the message. So let me go to the governor's race, which everybody is interested in. Kathy Hochul is your party's nominee. Do you see an easy road for her to the governor's seat? What about the entrance of Long Island Congressman Tom Swasey? I think there's a lot of question among my colleagues and uh, and, and folks in this uh, in, in who do political work who have long questioned why, uh, respectfully, why Congressman Swasey is is doing this. Uh, you know, his numbers are very low uh, in, in all the polling that's out there. He's running against an incumbent governor at this point that uh, that has done well whose numbers amongst primary uh, voters in particular are very high. Uh, but now, look, you know, I, I think I, and, uh, Kathy Hochul would be wise to, to treat the primary and the general very seriously. I think she is. Uh, but, you know, she enters the primary as a heavy favorite. And look, we're in New York State, uh, and I think that any Democratic nominee would enter a general election as the favorite, especially running against someone uh, who, uh, after the January 6th, siege still tried to decertify the national election and bought into uh, Trump's conspiracy-laden, totally irresponsible, borderline criminal 
uh, allegations that somehow this election was stolen. He, after his own place of work was stormed by rioters, by insurrectionists, he still didn't have the courage to stand up and say, enough is enough. Let's certify the election. He didn't even do that. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I I think that Kathy Hochul is in a great position, but she should not take anything for granted. You're talking about Lee Zeldin. You know, I saw a poll that said that in Hochul's case, of course, she is leading in the field among Democrats. And yet there wasn't a great sense of excitement about her candidacy. What do you make of that? What I make of it is she's she's still new. She's been on the job for a few months. And so uh, she she is still in, in the eyes of many New Yorkers, I think, uh, becoming a known entity. And I do think she's done very well these first number of months. Uh, she doesn't even have a single budget under her belt yet. And so I think by the time we get to April 1st, April 2nd, and we have a budget that we can be proud of that invests in New York's people, I uh, there's going to be a lot of excitement, for example, uh, that's that's driven uh, by by that work product. So I think give it time. I you know there are plenty of people who are excited about uh, her as governor. She's the first female governor in her state's history. Uh, but as the weeks and months go on and people see what she working with the legislature are going to produce this session, I think there's going to be even more excitement. Let's talk very briefly, because we only have two minutes or so, about redistricting. Is this hypocrisy from the Democrats or payback for past Republican gerrymandering? What people have to understand is that we ungerrymandered the Senate Republican maps. And so the Senate Republicans during debate, they got up and they were howling about how this is unfair and the maps changed so much. Well, yes, the maps changed so much because you gerrymandered the heck out of New York State 10 years ago. And to give you an example of how this was a far more responsible process, the 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 deviation between 10 years ago, between the largest population wise Senate district and the smallest population wise Senate district was nearly 10 percent that the Republicans drew a decade ago. The largest deviation uh, this year in the newly drawn maps is about one percent. And so, you know, you look at the objective criteria, and this was a far more responsible process. But, of course, the maps look differently because we ungerrymandered what the Republicans did 10 years ago. We've been talking, of course, to Senator James Skoufis, a Democrat from New York State's 39th Senate District. Senator Skoufis, you're always invited here because you always tell it like it is. And we appreciate your being with us. And if any of these questions has offended you, I certainly apologize. No apology necessary because there was no offense. And this, as always, was a pleasure. 